In my last video, we looked at how FizzPuppet is able to achieve a use after free on a physical page of memory. Be sure to first go back and watch that video before watching this one so that you understand exactly how we got here. At the end of that video, I briefly mentioned how if we can make the kernel reuse this page to allocate something interesting, we can build powerful primitives on top of it. So today in this video, we're going to dig into that further and make the kernel reuse that VM page for object allocations that we can then leverage to build read and write primitives. As a quick recap, in the last video, we looked at how by triggering an integer overflow in the kernel's VM subsystem, we were able to create a state where the userland process had a dangling page table entry in its physical memory map for a VM page that has been released back to the page allocator. The dangling PTE provides us read and write access to the underlying physical page that the freed VM page represents. That VM page is currently back on the free list, along with many other VM pages ready to be recycled and used for something else when the need should arise. So how can we as the attacker influence the system such that our target VM page gets reused by the kernel and that the kernel uses that page to allocate some object of importance that will be useful for us to build primitives from. There's plenty of ways in which we can make the kernel allocate new memory all from within our own process. For example, most system calls require the kernel to allocate various data structures or objects in kernel memory to handle the request of that specific call. These allocations, however, will normally fall into a free slot in a given memory zone and not necessarily require new VM pages. Memory zones are essentially subdivisions of the kernel heap used to serve allocations of a specific size or type. When the zones are initially created on kernel boot up, they are given some VM pages to use for their allocations. These pages are then logically divided up into smaller elements of some fixed size depending on the zone. So for example, there are plenty of generic data calloc zones which are used to serve specific size data allocations for example, data.calloc.256 divides up its pages into 256 byte elements and serves allocations up to this size. There are also special use zones which serve allocations for a specific type of object. You can view all of the kernel memory zones on the active system along with other statistics using the zprint command on macOS. We'll look deeper into how zones work and how reallocation will work in the context of an example. The original FizzPub exploit reallocates the page for various different XNU structures, which it then builds primitives upon. However, in this video, we're going to be looking at a more straightforward approach, which was documented by Alfie CG on his blog, but actually originates from a different iOS kernel exploit, weight buffs. This method was also used in the dopamine jailbreak for various iOS versions where physical UAFs were exploited. This method uses IO surface objects as the target object for reallocation. IO surfaces are a commonly used object in the iOS and macOS kernel, used for sharing graphics buffers across processes, and mostly used in graphics processing operations where large amount of graphics data needs to be shared with the kernel in a, an efficient way. The actual details of why IO surface exists is not really important for this video. All we need to know is that we as a user land process can allocate as many IO surface objects in the kernel as we need via simple IO kit API calls from a sandboxed app. IO surface objects are allocated into a dedicated zone named IOKit.IO surface. The element size for this zone is hex 400 bytes, which means that every IO surface object that gets allocated is given a hex 400 byte slot within one of the pages within the zone IOKit.IO surface. This element size of hex 400 multiplied by 16 gives us hex 4000, which is the page size. This means that we can fit 16 IO surfaces onto each page of memory in the IO surface zone. If we look at the device after a fresh reboot, we can examine the IO surface zone and observe that it only has a couple of wired pages of memory in use. This is because there hasn't yet been a huge amount of IO surfaces allocated by the system. We can create a new IO surface by invoking the external method create surface fast path from our sandboxed app. And then we can even stick this piece of code in a loop that iterates 10 times. And this will trigger the allocation of 10 new IO surface objects in the kernel, each one being allocated into an element slot within a page in the IO surface zone. So what happens when the zone begins to become full? We can actually keep allocating more and more IO surfaces without freeing any of them. So soon enough, all of the 16 elements per page in the IO surface zone will be filled. When this happens, the kernel will trigger a zone expansion by calling the function zone expand locked and passing the zone as the first argument. A zone expansion involves adding new virtual pages to the zone to facilitate new future allocations. And of course, these new pages will come from the free list that our target VM page was added to earlier. 
So from this point, it becomes pretty clear what our general strategy is. We just need to allocate enough IO surface objects to trigger a zone expansion. Our target page will hopefully be added to the IO surfaces zone as a result of the expansion. And then we need to allocate more IO surfaces after this expansion with the hope that one of these new allocations will land on our page. To improve our odds of reallocating our dangling page for an IO surface zone page, we're first going to make some changes to the original exploit code. Instead of only creating a single dangling page, we're first going to change this and create a bunch of dangling pages. The process outlined in the previous video consisted of five steps that creates a dangling page table entry, and these five steps can very easily be repeated. So we'll move this code into a function of its own named make PUAF page, which performs the steps to create the dangling page table entry and returns the user space address of that page. We can then call this function a hundred or so times in a loop and store all of the dangling page addresses somewhere. This now puts us into a position where we have multiple dangling PTEs and multiple freed VM pages on the free list in the kernel. Next, we'll enter an iterative process where we create X amount of IO surface objects and then immediately scan all of the hundreds of dangling pages to see if one of the IO surfaces has landed there. If no IO surface object was found, we just repeat that process. Soon enough, some of these IO surface object allocations will trigger the zone expansion. One of the pages will be pulled from the free list and added to the IO surface zone, and then subsequent IO surface allocations should land on that page. Once we detect an IO surface on our page, we can just hex dump all of the contents here from userland, and we'll see a bunch of kernel pointers and other fields that make up this IO surface object. The original technique here actually involves setting a very recognizable value onto the IO surface via legitimate API calls as the pixel format, which we can then very easily see from the hex dump each time. And this lets us know 100% that an IO surface object was allocated on that page and not some other kernel data structure by chance. For even more introspection into what happens behind the scenes here, I actually wrote some code to dump out all of the kernel addresses for the VM page structures, which our dangling PTEs refer to. And then I used XNU Spy, a project from Justin Sherman that allows us to add custom hooks to kernel functions on check rainable devices. I used this to add trace logs in the function VM page grab options, which is the function used to pull VM pages from the free list. This function is called very frequently in the kernel, so if we filter this based on the caller and look for only times when it's called as a result of a zone expansion and then dump its return value, we can cross-reference the dumped VM pages from our process and the VM pages that were used in zone expansion and we should see one of these pointers overlap. This shows us that our dangling page was reused for zone expansion and an IO surface object was allocated on it. At this point, we're completely free to read and write to this IO surface object because we still have read and write permissions to that underlying physical page due to the dangling PTE. With some creativity, we can go on to build read and write primitives for the wider kernel address space by modifying certain pointers within the IO surface object and then interacting with the IO surface object through legitimate API calls to get and set data. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Again, all relevant links will be left below in the description. From looking at the stats from my previous video, I found that over 90% of the people who watched it were actually not subscribed. So if you are one of those people, then please hit the subscribe button. It will really help out the channel. Other than that, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.